Sean, how are you? Good day, good day. It's a pleasure. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice, nice to meet you. So I saw you come in, just fired the sig up. I thought, hey, let's get you on in. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for being part of this with us. I'm really glad to be joining, uh, joining the podcast with you, Mark. So uh, everybody um, who comes into the webinar um, can hear you and they can hear me. So just FYI. And I'm going to be, um, oh, there's Mark right there. Let me I'm sorry, Bradley. I just called you Mark. Oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> I apologize for that. I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, how are you? I am great. How are you doing, Bradley? There we go. Now we're in. Doing good. <laughs> Doing good. So yeah, I, I've gotten to the point with these things where I try to fire them up as close to the thing as I can. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got this relatively down down to a science, so we'll uh, we'll we'll wait until yeah five six minutes from now. We we got we got a lot of last minute registrations. We should have good attendance here, and then of course people will be watching it after the fact too. So thank awesome. thanks both y'all for being part of it. Of course. So Bradley, question for you. How is my audio acoustics? I'm just, I want to make sure I don't need to switch to a phone. It, it sounds good. Okay. So we're okay. I just want to make sure every once in a while I get a blip on my internet, which makes things a little crazy. In fact, Sean can relate to this. He and I had a chat, I don't know, last month and uh, right in the middle of it, my, my uh, voice just started going, and killed. So if something happens midstream, I can always switch to a phone, but I'll just assume this is okay for the moment. Hopefully I won't have any screaming kids. Yeah, it sounds sounds great, and I'm going to bear with me a second. Yeah, this is oh. uh, this is turned hey Bradley, out. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just got a note saying the Eventbrite doesn't have the actual Zoom link in it, is what Colin just said. Uh, when you register through Eventbrite, you should get it. I'm going to tell him that. Sorry, didn't interrupt just to make sure there wasn't something there. Well, that's all right. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to allow people to register 15, up to, up to another 15 minutes. Yeah, you have to register first awesome. and then you get it. Um, I'll just put it in. Okay. All right. Yeah, you, you, they tell you not to put the Zoom link out on social because trolls will come find it and try to enter your meeting. So, Mark, everybody joining the Zoom, thank you for being here. We're going to wait another four or five minutes to get going. We, we appreciate you. I think we ended up right around 200 registrants, which was great. Um, that's what I thought we would have. Um, and we'll, we'll see a good many of them here, and then people will be checking it out. But we'll, we'll keep it to an hour sharp. Um, People's attention span is low, <laughs> and, uh, and and we'll go through everything. But yeah, this is this is this is great. Y'all have a good holiday weekend. Yes, it was uh, actually more pleasant than I imagined, given the circumstances. So I was kind of pleasantly surprised. Good weather and just people seem to be very uh, out and about, walking through the neighborhood, which is nice. See some faces. There's nothing wrong with that. Not to be not to be pessimistic, but it'll definitely be interesting to see what 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 happens in two weeks' time, and and how much fun people maybe had uh, over the long weekend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll. Uh, so I'm originally from Alabama, so uh, Montgomery um, had a bit of a flare up um, where they had to bring some people to to Birmingham, uh, and uh, I don't think they've really figured out why. What, what the what the trigger for that was but yeah we're, we're in some strange times unprecedented if you're coming into the zoom we will get going in about two or three minutes so welcome you're in the right place also just a couple of, of notes um there is a q a feature in the zoom we're going to ask you to use that rather than type a question in the chat. Um, hi, Brian, thank you for that. Yeah, so say hello to me in the chat. I appreciate that. <laughs> say hello to the panelists in the chat. For questions you've got, we're gonna try to save the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar for questions. Um, 
please put those in the Q&A part of Zoom rather than the chat part of Zoom. If you are registered for the webinar, you will receive the audio and the video files from this webinar. It'll probably be in about 48 hours. We'll send those out. Um, so you'll get those as well. If you have to duck out, you know, we've been advertising that we're going to do that. So people knew it, but if you have to duck out, you know that you'll get that. I think that's about it. Any other housekeeping gentlemen that I'm leaving out? Don't Anything you don't so. want to talk about? Any skeletons in the closet? <laughs> All the bodies are buried and where they're located. Yep. <laughs> I'm happy to have my banner back. Um, I, I had to take this down, down for routine maintenance and uh, now it's back. So that's a beautiful thing. Awesome. Yes. We'll wait about another minute. If you're joining the Zoom, you are in the right place for the webinar on how venture capital views voice technology and conversational AI companies. We will be starting in just a moment. I got one text feedback piece, Bradley, that someone said the Tickets Live link page is missing links, but I'm assuming if everybody's getting into the webinar, so it's just one individual who's texting me. Nor yeah, uh, normally if the link is not available, you will get deluged with emails. And I've gotten, this is the second one I've gotten right here um, in about 12 hours. Yep. Um, so, um, if you if you're registered um if you registered for it but you didn't get the confirmation email or if that went to spam or you didn't see it then yeah you're going to be looking around for the link you know what you know what i'm going to do right now i'm going to email everyone registered with the link again hang on and then we'll and then we'll get going. Awesome. Um, let's see. Okay. I'm putting. I'm making this pretty direct. The title is all caps. Login info for the webinar. <laughs> And that's getting emailed to everybody right now. So, okay, yeah, and Brian, I see what you said. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's a smarter way to do it, but the, the only way I know is to put it, put the, it, it, the moment we create the Zoom, which we try to do at the last minute because they're constantly updating things, we put it into the Eventbrite confirmation email, but there's always a gap there, so. But now everybody who's registered will receive it. So we'll start. We'll start, and we'll give another sixty seconds or so, and we'll hit the ground running. You so, think? gentlemen, uh, when we start, I'll uh, ask you both to introduce yourselves. I'll introduce myself very briefly, but ask your, you to introduce yourselves and talk about your firms um, and what you do, and then we'll start to go through some of the questions and have an organic conversation. We'll leave the last ten to fifteen minutes for for Q and A, and be out of here at. 1 p.m. Eastern slash what, 10 o'clock Pacific? <laughs> For the very few people on the West Coast, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, one of the coronavirus side effects, I think people have started putting uh, Zoom credentials on their resume is a, hey, expert ninja at Zoom mechanics. <laughs> I thought we got rid of all the words like that, like ninja and guru and, <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe, maybe they're coming back. Um, yeah, I tell you, um, I, I saw the, um, I, know, I, I know several folks in Missouri where those pictures from Land of the Ozarks came out over the weekend. That was uh, interesting, you know, not to, I'll sort of leave it at the word interesting, not to delve into, not to start this with this, but and then uh, there was Maryland and there's some other places. It's, it's, uh, yeah, we're absolutely going to find out, um, you know, what the uh, what the state of all this stuff is, and and you know, I hope it I hope it doesn't affect them, but uh, you never know. We will uh, we're going to go ahead and get going. Let me check my email one more time, make sure. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Welcome to this webinar on venture capital and how VC firms 
view voice first companies. And when we say voice first companies, we are referring to companies that in whole or in part are using voice technology or conversational AI as part of their products or services. And my name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of a company called Score Publishing based in Nashville, Tennessee. We do a lot. We're not a normal publisher. We do a lot that puts us at the center of the conversation around voice and AI. Uh, if you care, go look at my LinkedIn. We're very pleased to have with us today two phenomenal guests to talk about this. Mark, I'm going to start with you. Tell us who you are. Tell us what Voice Punch is. Uh, tell us all about what you do. All right. Thanks, Bradley, and thanks for uh, having us on. Nice to see you. If, you know, unfortunately, in the circumstances, it's through a screen, but I think that's our new normal. Uh, so my name is Mark Layden. Uh, I'm the general partner at a early stage thematic voice, audio, and conversational AI investment fund called Voice Punch. Uh, we're headquartered in Los Angeles, California. Uh, voice Punch is started, I guess, beginning January 1st of 2019. We launched our first fund, focusing on really this movement towards the new voice interaction model that we saw happening across the wide spectrum uh, of organizations and businesses and entities. And just that unique movement and people starting to get um, these experiences with the advances in like natural language processing and talking to speakers. And, you know, we all saw what happened with the advent of smart speakers, really all the way back to really Siri as we started to talk to our phones. But we started to see this really coalescence uh, around voice interaction and experiences just really accelerating with the, the introduction of Alexa and Google Assistant. And so in the beginning of 2019, we really went down the path of saying, this is something from a trend perspective. You know, we like to, we like to think about it this way, that most uh, accidents happen at intersections, as well as most of the interesting things. And this movement to voice interaction models is one of those big intersection moments uh, that we saw and, to, and are taking advantage of that by being an investor. So I can go on and on about Voice Punch, but you know we're focused on the early stages of organizations, uh, companies. Bradley, uh, you you know a lot of and done a great job as a, one of the best industry advocates out there in kind of getting awareness about what's happening in voice. And so we are finding these really amazing companies that are really playing this unique space in this transitional area as people are developing and deploying all these really innovative new technologies and applications. And so our whole mission and model is to help the entrepreneurs. Uh, with capital, with strategic help and connectivity within the network and really bring great organizations the things they need to be to flourish in this environment. Mark, appreciate you joining us. And thanks for all the work you do with Voice Punch. You're really leading the way um, in, in many ways. We appreciate you. Sean, thank you for being part of this as well. It's a pleasure to meet you. Tell us all about you. Tell us about Omers. Tell us about it, everything you do. Sounds great. Yeah, thanks for the intro, Bradley. Um, yeah, so I'm Sean Chance. Uh, I'm a venture partner at Omer's Ventures. Uh, Omer's Ventures, for those of you who don't know, um, sits amidst uh, Omer's, which stands for the Ontario Municipal Employee Retirement System, uh, fundamentally a pension fund out of the province of Ontario in Canada. Um, as a venture fund, we sit within a very diversified portfolio of assets that Omer's has, which include everything from real estate to infrastructure, private equity, growth equity, um, and finally ventures. And so we represent of the $100 billion of assets under management that Omers has, uh, Ventures represents $1 billion in assets under management. Um, we are a transatlantic fund that has uh, three key offices, uh, one in Toronto, which I am virtually sitting in, as you can see, uh, one in San Francisco in the Bay Area, um, and another one in London in the UK. And so we really use those as our kind of three bases of operation. Um, we are an early stage investor, but a little bit later than Mark. And so Mark and I um, have actually uh, had quite a few good conversations, but we are typically series A, B, and C investors. Um, check sizes ranging maybe from uh, as low as four to five million USD and uh, getting up into the, the, the 20 million probably range. Um, we're quite um, hands-on investors. We tend to uh, take board seats and support our portfolio companies uh, quite closely uh, with all the, the great resources that you would expect from a, a larger investor like ourselves. Uh, from having an operations team um, to having obviously some pretty deep networks in the thematic areas that we invest in. Um, it just so happens that voice uh, is becoming rapidly one of those areas that we've decided to lean into a lot 
um, put out a little bit of material in publication. Um, but part of uh, this work with Bradley and uh, getting to know the community at large uh, is really more of our foray and leading into this space and understanding a lot of what's um, happening here uh, to complement a lot of the great companies we've already actually met in this space. Excellent, that's great. Thank you both for being part of this webinar. I'm, I wanna start with a question that I actually didn't put on the outline, but it's super quick. If both of you, you like that in front of your curveball already, it's, uh, it's the start of the week. Um, if both of you would say two companies um, that you have recently invested in and something about them or why, I think that'd be a good place to start. Either one of you can go first. Sure. Um yeah, so um, I'll pick a couple that are recent um, that have been announced and that are not voice related. Um, and well, I think over the course of today, we're gonna talk a lot about sort of the impacts of COVID, but I'll pick two that actually um, has seen a positive impact from COVID. Um, the first one is a company called Tehema, which is um, a Canadian company um, that does uh, the enablement of remote work um, as it would be. Um, we, don't, we don't have a crystal ball. This is not something that uh, we forecasted, but obviously um, remote work enablement, I think, is uh, at the top of everyone's mind right now. Um, and so this company um, has been a very timely and interesting investment for us. Um, the other one is a company out of Europe uh, that's called Deliverect, um, which is part of the te technology stack that you would leverage if you're a restaurant owner and you're leveraging services like Uber Eats to get food out to people uh, when your restaurant can't actually be open. Um, so that's, that's two from our end. All right. Well, so uh, I'll give you two. Um, one I'll give is Bamboo Learning, uh, which is a great voice first company that's really creating uh, compelling educational experiences for those earliest learners using um, Alexa and really multimodal experiences uh, with screen based devices and Fire TV and such. Um, and in this day and age where everybody's at home with their kids, this is in a way where you know, I, I think as a parent, there's not enough educational opportunities available because we're stuck in such confined quarters and because schools are, you know, have limited time frames and their Zooms and all these things. This is a really great complementary solution uh, for parents at home. We're looking for ways to get more exposure and more educational time uh, for their children. So I think they're doing an awesome job and they're seeing expanding usage. Ian Freed, who runs it, was, you know, a, a key person, it, it, Kindle at Amazon and then with Alexa. So he's doing a really good job running uh, Bamboo. The other, uh, I won't name is, is closed, but it's a, we haven't announced yet. They say it's a gaming company. I just, I bring it up. Uh, we closed an investment two weeks ago in a really interesting gaming application, voice first startup. And they have great uh, engagement usage and they're doing some really innovative things. But for us, it was, it was a no brainer because we've been looking at gaming and entertainment and voice as a really compelling area and hadn't quite find the, found the right investment opportunity and just happened to stumble across the right one. And you know, they're seeing great acceleration in terms of usage based on COVID and what's happening. And so you know, we're, we're excited to be a part of those as well as some other folks in the portfolio. Excellent. Yeah, I just figured starting with that might be a good way to paint a picture here at the, uh, the outset. So Mark, I'll start with you and then Sean, broadly, <clears throat> whether it involves voice and AI or not, what makes a company investable to you? What, what are the top things that you're looking for um, either uh, when you put the pencil to the paper or when you look at the management team, talk about your perspective on what you look at uh, with companies broadly. And then if you wanna address voice and AI, that's, that's cool too. Sure. Um, so, yeah. No. Oh. So the you know the thing is a little bit cliche, but usually always almost always starts with the team. And you know there's this there's this um, you know perfect uh, you know uh, cookie cutter model that every VC wants is like this team that's been there, done that, had multiple successes and exits, and you know all these things they come up and say, oh that's easy, and everybody's gonna write a check there. That's never the reality, or it's infrequently the reality that's a perfect situation. So, but it does start with the team. Um, some level of understanding that is based upon either just diving in feet first into, a, into their application or their, their company and startup, or they've kind of had related experience in previous startups certainly helps. But we look for, you know, great entrepreneurs who want help, are asking for help, not afraid to ask questions, not afraid to pivot. We find that pivoting, I think, is actually generally a really healthy thing. And so a number of companies we've invested in have made a pivot earlier in their career. And it just gives us some confidence that if, as the market evolves, 
almost every successful company pivots across their history. They never start off with one thing. It usually changes in so many ways um, along the course and journey. And so the team that can do that is really important. And then it gets to some of the generic things around the market space. Um, obviously, voice is a component. And figuring out what that means is kind of an interesting you know, debate. Um, we, you know, voice cuts across such a wide swath, uh, and it's gotten even a little, for, a little wider for us even more recently. As we used to say just voice and conversational AI, now it's voice, audio, and conversational AI. Just because the importance of audio is experientially exploding, in all these different areas and innovative um, startups are doing, I think, compelling new things. And so it's defining what spaces are most interesting in us. And we, we try to find, you know, we have our own model, these seven buckets with how we kind of define the market space. Um, and it cuts a very wide swath, but it's more of a voice centric mindset. And so we look at the different areas to say, hey, what's going what's gonna to be the most interesting? Because we think voice is going to be a de facto interactive model for every piece of technology in the future. Effectively, if it's got a chip, it's going to have some kind of voice interaction model in the future. Based on that premise, that, that, that opens you up to a wide slew of things. And what we have to do as investors is say, hey, we're looking for return. And what we know is that maybe this is true over the long horizon, but certain applications and certain pieces of infrastructure and certain market spaces, they're gonna mature more quickly than others within the voice ecosystem. And so we try and make bets based on some of the learnings we've had. We don't think we know everything. We keep getting smarter the deeper we go. And the focus, because we're this, you know, very narrow, five foot wide, a thousand miles wide, uh, deep investment fund, we're really focused on this one area that allows us to maybe see things maybe just a step or two quicker than maybe some others might within the voice space. And so we look to leverage that to invest in areas that we think, you know, great team, great market space, great opportunity, and a great ability to actually get there in a relatively decent amount of time, and not something to take, you know, 20 years because we're, we're structured on a 10 year investment model. So we wanna make sure we see these markets maturing fast enough to get, get a return within 10 year horizon. So those are some of the things we look at, Bradley. Excellent, yeah, Mark, appreciate that. Sean, uh, same question for you. What makes a company investable? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think I'll echo what Mark says in terms of you know product team and market are always kind of the three major axes that we consider. I think the, the other lens we add to that is always stage of company. And so uh, in an earlier uh, investment, you know, team tends to be one of the most heavily weighted. Um, and that will change, obviously, as sort of a company maybe becomes more mature. Um, a couple of nuances that I think are interesting for voice, however, um, you know, if you're tuned in and watching this and you have an interest in the space, then it's probably not news to you that there are so many different critical dependencies that we can inflect on when you think about how this shape, how this space is going to, to shake out. Um, and so one of the things that we look for from entrepreneurs who are building companies in this space is to have uh, unique or uh, founded views around what those dependencies are and how the space is going to evolve so that uh, it can help us understand how as a company that will ebb and flow with the way that this space will inevitably uh, mature over time. Um, the second one uh, is definitely on the softer side, but I think we, we're general believers that um, any of the, the, the managing teams that we work with, we really look for, for a chemistry. Um, and you know, I, that's, that's advice that I would give to any CEOs or founders that are out there, of, you know, when you're, when you're choosing your investors, or hopefully you have the ability to choose who's on your cap table, that that chemistry is actually really important. And so, um, you know, we have a certain style, a uh, certain way that we like to lean in with our companies and collaborate. Uh, and we're looking for entrepreneurs who share that sort of commensurate mindset um, that hopefully we can get into business together and build something amazing. That's great. I appreciate, uh, appreciate both y'all uh, diving into that. So Sean, I'm gonna start with you and then go to Mark. Um, I wanna ask about capital availability. So depending on your line of sight, you know, if you're, if you pay close attention on Twitter, you might see that, you know, there's been sort of an effort amidst uh, the pandemic to continue to have investments flowing um, and some interesting sort of innovations there. Um, but if you're not following that, you'd have no clue about that. And you might assume things have ground to a halt. Um, so there's a pandemic element to it. And then as voice and AI itself is concerned, you know, you go back two or three years ago, there's almost no investments in the space, period. Um, and that has really ramped up. 
So there's a confluence of events here. I want to ask you, what is the state of capital availability in your mind and in reality for companies that are doing great work uh, in this space that, that might be interested? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting conversation right now. Um, you know, I would say the availability of capital um, certainly is there, I think, uh, giving you a bit of a, a peek into the world that we're living in as investors. Um, you know, one of the things that's changed, for example, is, you know, because COVID has now been around for a few months, um, a lot of the cycles that we do when we're getting to know companies and entrepreneurs, um, they do take several months. And so uh, up until recently, we were still working with a lot of companies that we'd gotten to know in a, in a pre-COVID world. Uh, but now that we all sort of know that we're in this for at least a fair amount of time, uh, we're starting to meet with a lot of companies uh, that we've actually never met face-to-face -face ever before and crafting and building relationships virtually. Um, I think that's something that's new and that's, that takes a little bit of time. You know, how do you, how do you build trust? How do you build rapport? Uh, knowing that the conventional way of, you know, sitting in boardrooms and visiting offices um, and having dinners and breaking bread, all of those things that are part of the fabric of how we build relationships, so that's not there anymore. And so I think it's a unique challenge for investors, but it doesn't change the fact that I think uh, most investors, uh, although cautious, are still looking to deploy capital. Um, if we're to inflect on sort of what cautious means is that I think, it, you know, the current climate does force a sort of return to first principles uh, when we're looking at companies. Um, and so you'll probably see increased prudence uh, around metrics, right? Just core business fundamentals. I think, you know, COVID has certainly had this impact of be, being sobering. Uh, for a lot of folks out there. And so it's, it's not that capital is not available and it's not that investors aren't looking to deploy. I think it's uh, that they're looking at things with a different lens and that they're also pacing themselves to get to know what this new normal really is, uh, especially when it comes to the soft side of things. All right, uh, so I have a few thoughts I'll probably add in. So I'll try not to be too long-winded on this one. It's certainly an interesting topic as Sean was telling you. It's definitely one that, uh, we, we probably every day have a conversation about it. And it's a little bit different. So uh, Sean is later stage investing. We're earlier stage. So there's less capital committed already. For later stages funds, later stage funds, one of the things is a little more challenging. There's a lot more capital and the business is a lot further along. They've got a lot more customers. And a lot more is uh, invested. And so there's different types of conversations that later stage probably versus early stage, I would imagine. Some of it is around, hey, who in our portfolio is actually going to make it? Uh, because we've got a bigger bet versus earlier stage, it's it's still so early, and this is you know their ten year horizons, but we expect a long way for these companies to go before they get to really more meaningful uh, issues. So right now, it's probably maybe not as much of the severity uh, of hey, you know, what are we going to do about this company when usually it's the first investment capital or first professional institution around. So they're slightly different. And the questions always come up around COVID and, you know, this recession that's happening and what's going to, what's the, what's the outcome going to look like? And no one really has a crystal ball on that. But the way I think about it is, uh, and I, I think I stole this from another VC, but I like their perspective as he articulates said, look, venture capital runs on 10 year fund uh, cycles. So you got to predict there's going to be a recession during that 10 year horizon. You just don't know when it's going to be. So the fact that we're early in the fund life uh, time is actually maybe a good thing because generally speaking, you know, I remember conversations I was having with venture uh, capitalists years ago, actually during the dot com boom in the 2000s. And one of my favorite venture capitalists is at a big firm said, I was talking to him, I said, man, this is exciting. There's all this great stuff happening. And, you know, you must be investing a lot. He said, no, we're not investing anything. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He goes, look, on an investor perspective, we want to run counter cyclical. So we want to be investing when it's hard times, when the companies are really struggling to figure out their business model, really fine tuning the message, the product, the operation. So what invariably happens is recessions end. It's, they don't last forever. It's painful and, it, and it's hard, but the companies that figure these models out and really get it dialed in now are going to accelerate as the recession ends as we go back into the growth model. And that's where you get the really big payoffs from a venture perspective. So the answer to the question is there's certainly capital still available in the market. I see, you know, I hear different opinions. We're still actively investing. We closed our last deal two weeks ago. We have two more that are closing one later this week and another the following uh, if we keep on track. So I think deals are taking a little bit longer. 
Uh, people are being a little bit more methodical. There is, for the good deals though, I, I've been actually somewhat surprised the number of really interesting deals we're in diligence with uh, over the last month versus the previous three. And that, that I think is somewhat indicative that the quality of the entrepreneurs getting into voice is definitely increasing. Um, whether it's, you know, seeing signaling data on things like when Clubhouse gets this giant, you know, capital raise and people are like, oh my gosh, we need to really think about this to other great firms spending a lot more time like Omer's. And I can give you a list of other venture capital firms that we hear from weekly. They're saying, hey, you know, we really like what's happening in this area. We want, you know, what exposure to your deals is the first thing they're asking for. And they're asking for other perspectives and us helping them think through, you know, what are they gonna make the most interesting investment opportunities. In conclusion of my long-winded answer, sorry about that, Bradley, is look, there's definitely capital available for good deals and good entrepreneurs. They're still happening for sure. Um, it was a little bit of a shock the first month or so, and then the, the head started popping up again and people like, oh yeah, that's interesting. So I think we're in a good position. There's still tons of capital out there. And if you're having trouble or you know have a great startup that you're working on building at its early stage, please connect, reach out. We'd love to hear from you uh, and know what, what you're up to. If you are in the webinar and you have questions, just a reminder, make sure to put those in the question and answer component of the Zoom uh, rather than in the chat. Uh, that's where we'll go to look. We'll try to leave the last 15 minutes or so open for questions. I want to ask about portfolio companies and what you may have had to do to support them. You know, I think what we've seen with this pandemic is um, upheaval, uh, disruption acceleration of the way that things were already going. We got there faster um, and we've seen politics. So we've seen a lot of different things. And I'm curious, and Mark, I'll start with you and then Sean, um, what sort of support have your portfolio companies needed during this time um, and how have you provided that? So, you know, I, I call this kind of the waterbed effect uh, with COVID. You know, you push down here, water goes somewhere else. So it's, un, it's uneven the impact it's had on our portfolio companies. Some have seen acceleration uh, just because people have moved home and there's a lot more usage of voice speakers as an example, because it used to be people were out of their homes for, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours or more a day working. And suddenly they're now uh, at home more and these voice speakers that they've had and they use maybe just for simple tasks before are now getting a lot more utilization. So our application layer uh, companies are actually, I think, except for maybe one doing really, really well. And the one that's not is seen because they're in the hospitality space and because, you know, people are not traveling. Uh, they've absolutely seen their business come to a standstill for new business. Their existing customers are all staying. I don't think they've lost a single customer, surprisingly. I was kind of impressed by that. But you know, when I think about it, you know, um, there's so many different pieces of that conversation, uh, Bradley, and how, how it impacts companies. I look at it more of the voice, the movement to voice interaction models and startups that we're invested in is a trend that was already happening. It's not a trend that's suddenly going to stop to say, hey, you know what, that was a mistake. We're not going to do that. That trend, that train's already left the station. And in fact, what COVID's done in a lot of cases, it's probably accelerated it. The flip side, though, is their companies are going to go and need to raise more capital. Um, and we're, you know, get, you know, trying to gauge how to help support them in the best way we can, um, bringing in other partners to bring additional capital where it's necessary, and also making sure they have enough, you know, it used to be you'd raise on a 12 to 18 month horizon for your, uh, between rounds. Now we're like, hey, maybe it's 18 to 30 months, you need to have a better capital base, and also being more cognizant of your cost and burn, because it is a lot of opacity uh, within what's happening uh, in the market, and you don't have a crystal ball. But because we're early stage, there's a lot of high opacity anyway. And so I think we're fairly comfortable with that environment. And this is just one of our convictions are we're, we're following through on them. We're continuing to invest and we're continuing to help support our portfolio companies in every way we can. Sean, same question for you. Um, what have been some of the needs of your portfolio companies? How have y'all met those or attempted to meet those? Yeah, so I think there's there's definitely a nuance here with investing, you know, slightly later than um, someone like Mark in that, you know, our companies uh, are probably a little more capital intensive. They're a little bit later stage. They have larger teams, you know, everything that comes with uh, being slightly larger companies. And so, you know, the initial impact of COVID, I think, was, was 
uh, was triggering from a just understanding uh, capital runway, you know, what's, what's in the bank and making sure that, um, you know, these companies uh, are set up to weather however long the storm could be, uh, but also just understanding that there's uncertainty attached to this time and the greatest control that any company has over this uh, is honestly their burn. And so uh, just working with our companies to make sure that, that they're, they're fully kind of on top of this um, was sort of one of the initial um, impacts. I think moving beyond that, uh, it very quickly turned to, um, you know, our, our companies being the same as probably everyone on this call, which is how do we learn to work effectively remotely and to run businesses remotely? Uh, you know, as, as an investor in about 55 different active companies right now, we have a unique position in that um, we talk with these folks very, very often and are able to um, help create playbooks to leverage from one to the other. And so we very often have a portfolio company reach out and say like, hey, like, how do I know that I'm doing the right things in this new time? And so we're able to do things like host summits to have these types of exchanges and discussions um, and just kind of figure this all out together, right? The thing about unprecedented times, we've never been here before. Um, and so since we're, we're all here together, how do we uh, how do we establish some connective tissue to, to help each other out? Um, and so we try to be the catalyst and facilitator of some of those learnings and discussions. Um, and even you know now, I think there's, there's a blog post from one of my colleagues um, just talking about amongst our portfolio, how are people planning on going back to work when offices return? What does that actually look like? So I think these, these are all interesting um, new challenges that we're facing. Excellent, yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, I want to ask, um, I might have two more questions, but I definitely have got one before we open up for, for audience Q&A. Um, when Alexa came into the fore, you know, late 2016, early 2017, yeah, you had a lot of companies that have been working on voice for decades before, but that's what accelerated things. And it, it did so, so quickly that you, you started to get backlash uh, like you often do with people saying, ah, it's fad, it's a gimmick, it's not going to stick around. I think everybody probably on this webinar, or maybe most everybody on the webinar, um, including the three of us, feel like this is a permanent shift in how we use technology. But my question is, and Sean, I'm going to start with you and then the Mark will go to you, is, is there anything about... COVID-19, is there anything about this age that we're in, this, uh, anything you've seen lately to cause you to wonder existentially about voice technology and the underlying AI? I'm just curious. That's a really super interesting point, uh, Bradley. I actually just um, published something about this yesterday um, uh, on the Omer's blog, just sort of talking about um, some of the impacts of COVID, and I'll, I'll limit it to sort of two I think interesting inflections. Um, the first one is obviously voice is contactless uh, for the most part. And so uh, it, at a time where specifically the enterprise is really thinking about uh, what is the new normal going to be, you're seeing things pop up like, you know, voice activated elevators and, you know, all kinds of different interfaces that maybe previously would have taken a really long time to get around to voice are really having to use COVID as a catalyst. Uh, to now inflect and fast track those roadmaps because you know pushing buttons and physical contact may not be as prevalent in the new norm. Um, I know that a lot of companies, if you're sort of following the times, you know, back to work has a lot to do with installations of sensors so that you don't have to push or pull doors or things like that. And so you could see voice figuring into um, this new normal in the enterprise, which might be one of the interesting inflections for voice in the enterprise overall. Um, certainly that we're sort of something that we're keen on uh, looking into. Um, the other place that it's interesting, I think, is sort of the generational gap, right? It's one of the reasons that we find this space so interesting is when you sort of look at younger people today, uh, it seems more or less inevitable that the prominence of voice is going to continue to increase. I think there's actually some interesting data um, that's out there about that. And so I think if you sort of follow that trend, there's also a lot of reason to believe that the voice is probably going to inflect quite a bit in the next little while. I agree with everything Sean said, like 150%. I think that was spot on. In fact, we one of our upcoming investments is on the enterprise side in that area. So we should talk. It's, it's going to be an interesting one. I, I think that trend is exactly spot on within the office environment. What does work look like? 
Um, one of the things that's interesting, I think, anyway, is this schism that's been created because of COVID-19, where we have this, these two buckets of technology, hands-on and hands-off, right? Who wants to go in and actually touch a nasty elevator button or the button at the crosswalk or open a door? There's all these things where suddenly you're like, whoa, you know, how do I not have that interaction where I'm touching things all the time, which we never, we didn't know we were going to become germaphobes. Right, it's this amazing trend where I actually looked this up. I think it's like 9% of uh, the population in the US are germaphobic. And I'm like, that number, the, the, the society, whatever it is that does it, said their numbers are up like 30% uh, or actually 2X to 30% from 9% or whatever the numbers look at. I was like, holy cow, that's an amazing movement overnight where suddenly we have this attenuation to something that we never thought of. And so like think about going to like the grocery stores and checkouts and all that, you don't want to touch anything. And so voice is a trend that is not likely to ever subside. In fact, there's a good quote from the guy who invented the iPhone who's talking, he goes, you know, it starts with like clicks and clacks, the typing, the touch and finally the voice. It's like we're all moving towards the Jetsons, which is what we all want to get to. There's nothing in my mind that kind of derails this because it fits in with how we want to interface with technology. Voice is our most natural state. The first thing we do when we come out of our womb, we start crying. We use our voice. So the most natural logical extension is with technology is we're going to use voice in every way we interface with technology in the future. And AI is just part of that whole ecosystem, how it plays out. Pessimism, I'll give you the only things I see it, you know, the, the challenge is still the discovery issue within the voice uh, the platforms and making it easy for people to find the solution to the problem they have. And I don't know if it's going to take a splintering uh, with the model and how it's built, um, where, you know, these first party versus third party experiences or something that's going to have to happen. I do think it eventually will get solved. It may just be a brute force of time. Uh, that takes over, but that's the probably the single biggest area that I find a little bit difficult, at least as the voice speaker, but that's only one small piece of where the voice interaction model happens. But, you know, that's that's one of the things out there, but I, I don't think there's anything that really changes the trajectory that we're on because it, it's just a logical directional change for us uh, and how we work with technology today. Cool. So I'm going to do something that I haven't done for other webinars. I, I see we've got 14 questions here, which that number was like three a few minutes ago. So, <laughs> so I'm going to dive into the questions here and um, I'm going to just ask them one by one by one and we'll sort of do this rapid fire. And this reminds me of the scene from The Office where Michael Scott opens up the question and answer box. That didn't go very well, but uh, hopefully this will go better. Uh, so for Michael Atkinson, do these folks lead investments? Want to answer that? Homer's does, yes. We tend to lead. Uh, so generally we're participating. Um, so we're generally the strategic investor and someone else typically leads the investments or there isn't one particular lead depending on the consortium or how it comes together. Cool. So I'm just going to, I'm going to go through these quickly. Um, what is the investment climate? And if you're, if you're on the webinar and want to submit a question, hit it. Uh, I'm sitting here looking at it. We're going to uh, ask them all. From an anonymous attendee, what is the investment climate for devices, parentheses, earphones, hearing aid, hybrids, hearables? Awesome. I, I, you know, hearables to me is like the back door in the enterprise before the enterprise came home. That was always my belief is that those experiences. So we're looking at a range of different areas, whether it's middleware connectivity to the different voice clouds, to the hearables, to a range of different things that we think are interesting. But hearables are here to stay. And I think it's just another way that voice will be this kind of part of the fabric that will envelop us everywhere we are and every experience that we have. Sean, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think they're, they're an interesting part of, of how voice becomes more accessible um, for consumers, but also in the enterprise. You know, the, the difficult thing about investing in that space is always um, hardware is more challenging, especially as it gets to later stages. Uh, it tends to be more capital intensive. But even with that being said, um, you know, for the right, for the right company, uh, there's always interest. We got a question for Mark from another anonymous attendee. Mark, uh, what is your average ticket size? Do you invest in non-US startups? Do you invest in pre-revenue startups? Great question. So uh, I'll pick all three of those. So, so our stated range is 25,000 to 250,000. Most of our investments recently have been on the top end of that range. 
Um, we're actually in the process of raising our next fund. So those sides of the investments will go up as well uh, as part of that. Um, we invest, uh, actually a great question on where we invest. We invest internationally as well as US. We have two portfolio companies that are non-US, uh, one in Europe, one actually in Australia. Um, so voice is not, this is something I think is really important. It's not a US centric only experience. It's happening all over the world in Europe and Asia. And the, you know, it, I wish there were even more ways we could invest more broadly because it is certainly gonna be a phenomenon that's gonna be approached both differently in different marketplaces. Uh, and there's, a, there's some interesting nuances for another webinar we can talk about how they're deploying voice experiences in Asia versus here. Um, but I think it's super exciting. And there's a second, a third question I missed, Bradley. What was it? Uh, I clicked off of it. Let me see. Uh, it is, uh, do you invest in pre-revenue startups? Yes. yes, absolutely. Okay. Next question, Mike Atkinson, B2C or B2B preference in deal flow? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's hard to say. We, we honestly look at both. Um, you know, see the voice space as being relatively nascent. And so um, I, I don't know that there's necessarily one that's, that's right. Um, I would say that we put probably a lot more emphasis on, uh, certainly at our stage, product market fit and, you know, kind of the, the types of problems that you're able to address through voice tech and then think second about whether it's in the B2B or B2C space. Ditto. Go ahead, Mark. Ditto. Exact same answer. Okay. And I see we had that same question again down the way. I'm going to mark that. From Dr. Yared Alimu, have you invested or consider investing in an emotion recognition technology in healthcare? An emotion recognition. So we've looked at a bunch of emotion, sentiment, and other type applications have we seen one specifically in health i've seen it for health and wellness within the healthcare continuum like the four walls of a hospital i'm not sure that we've looked at one specifically uh in that context but there's certainly a lot of different areas where uh voice and emotion are certainly you know voice is a high fidelity transmission model versus like text is low fidelity you don't know when people like are they mad at me when they text are they not mad at me but that high fidelity nature of voice actually adds some interesting nuance so we think that's an interesting uh space uh an application area for voice uh, startups but i haven't seen one that i think is definitely only healthcare specific nothing to add some similar views to mark Okay. From Emma Delage, a uh, question about would you be interested in companies uh, located in Europe to Mark? He said the answer to that is yes. Uh, they invest internationally. From Tom, how do you see the investment distribution across <coughs> technology versus content versus application slash business verticals? Sort of covered that a little bit. Any, any, anything to add there? Um. So technology content versus uh, business growth. So we used to have a balance between like half, we're trying to focus on infrastructure and half of the application layer. Um, I think content experiences, the audio piece is cropping up in a range of different areas. A lot of great things happening from companies doing short form audio, uh, whether it's you know one way, two way or otherwise. I think there's, there's a lot of different interesting things that are happening. And I don't know how that plays out, but I certainly think people are moving towards, uh, whether it's companies like Spoken Layer uh, or some of these others are doing really interesting things uh, on content. So um, we don't have a stated balance between them. Uh, we'd like all types, as, a, as long as it has that voice interaction model of some capacity, um, I think we're, we're game. Sean, anything, anything to add there? Uh, no. Okay, cool. Uh, from Brian Owen, Sean, Brian Owen here, the solid state lighting and voice tech liaison to OCE. Are you seeing developments of interest coming from Canadian voice tech companies and sources beyond SoundHound and Braden Reams voice flow? Yeah, those are, those are interesting ones. I mean, I think the, yeah, the Canadian landscape for voice uh, has had a few um, notable companies come out. You, you point out a few of them. Um, I think we're seeing uh, a handful of interesting um, seed stage companies right now that are a little bit um, uh, ahead of where we want to be. Um, but to be quite honest, the I think the, the voice space for us is interesting when you take a global lens on it just because it's evolving in so many different ways. Um, and so although we are a Canadian investor, we'd love to see some great companies come out of Canada. 
um, we've been spending you know, an equal, if not greater amount of our time um, looking at the US and looking at other markets like Europe. Okay, excellent. Another question uh, for you, Sean, from uh, Rob Fletcher for Omers. Given uh, that you use the word later stage, what does that mean in terms of gross revenues? What sort of gross revenues do you tend to look for? Yeah, certainly. Um, it's hard to put a, a hard, fast number to this. Um, you know, the majority of what we do is not pre-revenue, I can say. Um, and so to look at, you know, depending on what the revenue model is, if you're looking at a million or a couple million dollars a year, you're probably somewhere near uh, the, the sort of realm of um, having enough revenue for us to, to take a look. Uh, but that being said, I think, again, the voice space is very nuanced. And for the right company, uh, we certainly look beyond those boundaries sometimes. So I wouldn't let that sort of limit a conversation, uh, but certainly as a general guideline um, for our investments, that would be true. Okay. Brian is looking for a story for his piece. Brian, reach out to these gentlemen directly for that. Um, Mike, we've gotten a couple of your questions. I'm going to come back to yours um, as we go through. Uh, from Mark Gray, what is your typical time frame from meeting a new company to investment, assuming it's good quality and a fit? Uh, good question. Um, it, you know, it's funny. We, uh, I would say, I'm just thinking this through because we had this conversation the other day. I would say it's 30 days. Uh, it's still relatively quick um, just because we're so narrow that usually we know either the comparables to the startup in a lot of ways or who to talk to to kind of figure that out. So our own diligence process, because we're small and nimble in that way, works relatively quickly. Uh, but I'd say it's about a 30 day run rate, but there's some that take longer because, you know, you just, it, it, it just, there's ones that you have to really gel on a little bit before you really grasp it. And if there's not crazy competition for it, you don't have to move as quickly. The flip side, there's others where they're, you know, two weeks or less, we just have to get it done very fast and be done because there's the, the round is going to close. There's enough interest there and we have to move our process faster. So not hard and fast, but I'd say it's about a 30 day window is about where we're running right now. Okay, Sean? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think the, it's, it's, again, it's hard to put like a definitive window on it. I'd say we are definitely not faster than Mark <laughs> being a little bit later stage. But, um, you know, the, 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 the insight I would put out there is that um, we certainly prefer to get to know entrepreneurs long before they're even thinking about raising. Um, and so, you know, this idea of like, hey, I'm looking to raise some money uh, at this time. Let's just hurry up and call a bunch of VCs and we're on that list. That certainly can work, um, but we actually tend to reach out to companies out of phase, get to know them so that by the time they actually are looking to raise money, we've actually already established a relationship with them. We already sort of know where each other stands. Um, I think that's a, a better process for everyone, and I would encourage anyone out there who's thinking of fundraising uh, to actually you know, kind of think outside of the bounds and build some relationships, especially with strategic VCs that you think could be accretive to your business, um, and warm those relationships up and get to know those folks long before you're actually looking to raise. We got 12 questions left for 12 minutes. So we're going to see how we do here. From Paul Volchev, do you prefer investing exclusively or with multiple, multiple co-investors on a Series A? Are strategic corporate co-investors important? Either one of y'all. Yeah, I mean, for us, um, we certainly appreciate uh, a, any type of syndicate that can bring accretive value, whether that's a strategic uh, or, or another VC. And so we're, we always welcome that. Um, we also do have a large number of investments where, you know, we've done the Series A all, all by ourselves because that's sort of been uh, better for that situation. Yeah, you know, for us, um, we, we like having uh, lead VCs because we're not uh, trying to lead. So they do a lot of the diligence, uh, which makes our process a little bit easier because someone's done some of that heavy lifting uh, that you would see. Uh, in the process. So that makes it a little bit easier for us as we go through the, pro the evaluation. Okay. Um, I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to ask this question from Mike that was at the top here. Do you prefer use cases that are on uh, the Google and Alexa platforms, the, the, the heavy hitters, or are you also interested in proprietary NLU platforms? So the answer is, I'd say we're indifferent. Uh, is probably the best way to say it. We absolutely don't have a preference directionally because we think voice interaction models, we think the voice speakers are, it's, it's a concrete example that people always glom onto and they can, they can use as an anchor point for voice. 
experiences, but we think that is just one of many different endpoints you're going to see. So we don't really have a preference for uh, whether it's on a voice speaker or not at all. Yeah, I'd echo that. We're indifferent as well. Uh, the important thing is that, uh, as you know, as I sort of mentioned before, regardless of the platform that you're leveraging, you've got a, a vision for uh, your go-to-market, which you know may be a little bit easier if you're leveraging one of the existing platforms, uh, but certainly like a key ingredient that we'd be looking for. Okay, from Clem, what is the trend for investment, embedded voice systems or cloud solutions? Uh, seeing both. You know, I, you know, I have opinions on it, so I don't know. Share, but I don't, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't know that I have a. I, I, so both, are, both are interesting for different reasons. Um, the embedded or things at the edge, where you get to try and address uh, these experiences, where you have some privacy concerns. Otherwise, there are certainly use cases for that. I, I just, I have some questions about whether how how, how good a long term businesses they make uh, to invest in these really. Uh, uh, specific edge case uh, voice interaction uh, solutions. Yeah, I, I agree with what Mark said. I also, I don't know if it necessarily has to be an either or uh, also. So there's, there's a, you know, I think the, the long tail of it perhaps includes elements from both. There's a number of questions that relate to, does it make sense to reach out to you at a certain period of time for mentorship, uh, there's a couple of questions actually that ask, ask that. Um, there's some other questions that are not directly related. Um, obviously, if you've been watching the webinar, you've seen these gentlemen, uh, I think it suffices to say they'd be happy to answer any questions you got uh, that are on a personal basis. I'm gonna mark these um, as answered here. I'm gonna ask, um, from an anonymous attendee, are you seeing any emerging trends on the way voice startups come into the market or go to market? Emerging trends how they come into the market, go to market. You know, um, hmm. I don't know that I have a great answer for that question. I guess, like I said, my, my litmus test is two, two data points I look at is caliber of the entrepreneur, uh, which I think is increasing. And that's not to be unfair to all the people who came before, but just the quantity of quality deals by quality entrepreneurs, I think is going up. Um, and then um, how they come into the market. Um, I'm not sure I had a second thought, but it may come to me later, but that was my, that was my answer. <laughs> sure. I mean, maybe I can help you out, Mark. Like I think maybe not really different than, than um, any other technology. I think what ends up happening is you know, you've got a lot of really smart people out there that are seeing just the number of problems that we have when interfacing with technology and how unnatural that can be and how, how much more that could be simplified. And, and those folks sometimes turn to voice as a logical way to solve a problem or to improve a workflow uh, or an interface. And I think those, some of the interesting companies we've seen recently certainly come from that. Um, you know, the other fertile ground for this is always uh, academia, right? You've got a lot of really smart people coming out of some of the big schools in the in the U.S. specifically. In Canada, you look at, at University of Toronto, you look at Waterloo, uh, Queens. I think those schools are all producing some really great talent, and some of those folks are thinking about kind of human machine interfaces and kind of how voice is poised to um, play more uh, prominently in that. Yeah, to add on to that, thank you, Sean. By the way, um, <laughs> I, so I think that what what's happening is that you know this 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 uh, explosion in terms of voice endpoints is interesting, but you know, a lot of the interaction models are, are uh, the end user really command-based interaction models like turn on my lights, set the temperature, do this. Really the, the next level evolution where this amazing innovation is really gonna come from is this turn-based interaction model where we don't, won't know the distinctive difference between talking to a voice experience versus a human experience. So that's going to create all these interesting applications that it's one of the things that unfortunately in some ways accelerates our reduction in the number of people that we need to do things. Because in fact, you won't see, I mean, call centers are the obvious example. When you see what's happening there, they're going to get decimated because these voice interaction models are so powerful and work so well. We were, we were uh, looking at one startup uh, recently and they are a big call center business. They built their own voice uh, modality to go, kind of be the front end experience. Uh, and they put it on a test against their human uh, group of people in this pod. And I think they had like, 
I don't know, 75 people in this pod, they were taking calls and they reduced it within like two months to like 30 people and the yield had gone up like 20% in terms of what they were doing. So by their KPI. So it is, it's amazing the efficiency of what we're able to do with these voice experiences so that you're not going to know in the future you're talking to a human versus a, a machine in large part uh and it just it's going to cause incredible displacement of the world but you know i think on the positive side you know maybe it's, there's other opportunities and people learn how to be involved in these new technologies that are coming but there is definitely going to be some human costs that come along with that but that's that's yeah we got five minutes we're going to take one more question on healthcare, which I'm going to ask, and then there's two questions that are some variant of what is your take on this or that, and we're going to play one word answer. <laughs> so, so I'll have you give me a one word answer for both of those. But the healthcare one uh, to, to answer uh, however you want is from James Gardner. There was much buzz about a year ago regarding voice and healthcare. Recall Amazon touting HIPAA conformance. Has any of this gone anywhere? It seems no to me. What might we expect from payers, providers, retailers, et cetera? There is a conference coming up in August about this, I might add. Well, any, any thoughts uh, about that? You know, I think they should go to your conference, Bradley, and they're gonna have some really good thoughts and big ideas. I think there's a lot of interesting things happening there, but you know, in the short time, I just think it's, I think it's an interesting space and there's a lot of amazing technology coming out of that, whether it's diagnostic, uh, whether it's workflow related within the four walls of hospital voice is certainly a focus for Amazon. I certainly think it's not just them. I think it's truly going to be impactful to the whole healthcare ecosystem. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a space that could benefit from it tremendously. We've met with a lot of companies that are trying to make inroads there. I think the difficult thing about that space is that it, it tends to move maybe a little bit slower as well. And so when you put those two things together, you know, they, they, they could benefit a lot. Um, but they move more slowly. They'll probably end up moving at about normal pace by the time it's all said and done. Um, but um, I, I would agree with you in that there's, there's probably still some work to be done there. One word answer. So we'll play word association. I'm gonna say the question, you give me a one word answer from both of y'all. What is, first, there's two questions left and we'll wrap it up. What is your take on voice purchasing or using voice to initiate an offer and an eventual purchase. So what's your take on voice purchasing? One word. If I only get one, then it's gotta be Alibaba. You gotta, you gotta look up some of the stuff they've done and if that's indicative, then it could be interesting. Okay. TBD. TBD. <laughs> Cheated, and an acronym. <laughs> I think uh, Joey. Okay, we'll, we'll let that slide, Mark. Um, and uh, finally, What's your thoughts on the podcast and audio content market? How do you see the interactive voice technology interactive voice technology impacting this area? So one word answer, hot, cold, whatever it is. What thoughts on uh, podcast and audio for this market? Exploding. Yeah, very, very hot. And, and uh, I think further bolstered even by COVID. Gentlemen, thank you for the time. Thank you for sharing your perspective with me and everybody on the webinar. This has been recorded. The audio and video files will be made available to everyone who has registered uh, probably within the next 48 hours. Thank you for everyone to, for being part of it with us. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Bradley. Thanks, Bradley. Good seeing you, Mark. Good seeing you too, Sean. Have a great rest of your week. We will talk to you soon. Thank you both.